So uh, actually, I was a little bit about staff. When you see staff, it's a very interesting thing because uh, ma'am brought up very important facts. Fact one uh, that we about staff is that yes, we are actually you get a lot of staff as such. By and large, what has happened over a period of time is the concentration has always been about the hospital acquired staff. But if you start looking at it, the latest, because we are part of the AMSP program of the ICMR, where we are collecting data for the last five years along with the CDC. So what happens is northern part of India, most of our HAs are basically gram negatives. Now, initial part, the data that used to come out till last year, then we started reworking is that when we started seeing staff also, we used to consider, whenever we used to get a staff, we used to think that it is a hospital acquired infection. This time we started taking data. No, we'll take a history. Was that patient admitted in 24 hours or 48 hours? Do we have a specific history? Then now the recent data that's coming out of it, yes, we are seeing community required staff, which is going to, that was the reason that we started adding those questions that what we were thinking only as HA, because the question framework was that uh, anytime you get a staff, immediately the lab would say, oh, we have got a staff and this is because the patient is in ICU, they put it as, as HA. Now, suppose the patient came from periphery with an abscess, came to us, then he got serious and came to our ICU. That technically, he has actually caught the infection outside. So when we started taking that component of the issue, we started thinking, yes, there is community acquired staff. So MRSA, these are MRSA. Yes, ma'am. So now community acquired staff, MRSA, have been have started coming up in this country. So what is the difference? Ma'am, very importantly pointed out the difference was in the genetic makeup. There is one important genetic makeup that is PVL gene is also present in community acquired staff, not in hospital. How does it make a difference? The difference is that when you have PVL gene, the, the effectiveness of vancomycin starts decreasing. So community acquired staff, as per all international data, your Clinda becomes a much more important drug as compared to vanco. And the other thing that Pam brought out was very important was the multiple sources where the staff keep on getting in and you will keep on having this recurrent infections. One of the reasons is like TB, staff is also an intracellular organism. So how do you kill that? So what's the answer? So you, when you have repeated after three, four weeks, again, you start coming in. Along with this, you add rifampicin. So that becomes a very important drug. Otherwise, you most surgeons keep doing that. They'll keep on doing it. Then they'll say that we want added vanco. Then, oh, aaj kal ek naya hai. Jabi saptam de sapta de dimbi chal. Talk about it afterwards. So you hit everything. The thing is, it's not going to go because that's not the back antibody which is going to kill it. <laughs> okay. So let's start with UTI. Yeah. yeah. Had lots of macrophage activation syndrome with MRSA. Yeah. And uh, most of them were treated with ticoplanin. And our theory is that we are not killing enough intracellular staff resulting in macrophage activation. So, I mean, no, that's something... point one, two, three. You will find always macrophage activation in, in sepsis. So, that doesn't make it, make it a That is the reason. If you want, to, we have few articles which we have already published also. And we are working on that with uh, actually in Manitoba. So the point one is getting sepsis and getting macrophage in bone marrow doesn't make it the accurate completely. You need to also see other things. So because sepsis itself is an activator of both ferritin as well as the marrow. So there you will treat. Now, why is that happening is again that again the multiple reasons. What UVC call is HLH has now the term after COVID, it has become more of a cytokine storm. In most cases of sepsis, if you're removing the basic pathogen, it will automatically improve. Yes, you are right. Tico planning, yes, you might, it, it is effective, it is MRSA. But as Mayan said, remember one thing till date, the best actually bactericidal, ask any pharmacologist, is penicillin and penicillin group. So, one, if you are using penicillin, the chance of clearance is much higher, any penicillin group. Tico planning, the clearance is less. But if it is MRSA, Remember, if it's possible, add a thumb. Then you will get much better effect as compared to this. But you have to be careful about one thing. If you are actual HLH, then you will also be having hepatic hepatic injury. And then, therefore, be careful about adding the thumbs in. And before that, check the liver and then go ahead and add it. So that is like you should do it after three, four weeks. You have stopped. Again, it's recurring. You have a protocol. Then you go ahead and do that. So, yes, we are talking about urinary tract infections. And when you talk about urinary tract infections, basically you are looking at different things. Now, urinary tract infection technically can be again divided as per 
when you talk about using antibiotic, it is whether first of all are you using it in the low for the lower tract or the higher tract. Now, when you talk about any antibiotic, the three things is selection of antibiotic, the dosage of antibiotic, and finally, what you want to discuss about is what is the duration of an antibiotic. So we'll talk about that. So acute for most purposes, what you will see is. Is in if you look at any ID component, if you have fever with UTI, irrespective of whether your CT or ultrasound shows or not shows, it is in the upper tract, as simple as that. If the patient is having chills, if the patient is having chills, irrespective, after ultrasound, there is enough studies, it shows that actually there was one study in US which showed that if you look at symptom of fever and chill, it is more sensitive of having of showing that the infection has gone into the upper tract as compared to a USG radiological examination. Now, the other thing that you want to say is basically is the symptoms of burning, micturation, frequency, urgency. These are actually symptomatology of the lower tracts. Now, if you have a patient who is catheterized, then you are not going to see these symptoms. The only symptom that is helpful there is fever. The other thing that you want to see is the what are the risk factors that are present you know pretty well there are certain risk factors which are always there that is indwelling catheters previous prior antibiotic usages which actually determines what type of treatment are you going to plan for and then there are behavioral things people who are holding on certain jobs where they are holding on infrequent voiding frequent recent intercourses that is something which can lead to frequent recurrent infections and that <coughs> physiological of course changes like pregnancy and all and of course, there are certain genetic susceptibilities and of course, the, the anatomical changes like you have multi stones or there is stricture and all, which I think we all must be knowing about. The symptoms and signs we have already discussed. Here, what I would go further ahead and talk about is that when you have a complication, you can have bacteremia, septicemic shock, aspirinephric abscess, renal failure, emphysematic pyelonephric, different sorts which we can see. I'm pretty sure in the last two days, we must have discussed about all these complications and all. So, we'll go basically to a diagnostic approach. As a clinician, the first thing that I want to know about in any UTI urinary tract is what is underlying condition? Is he having any other comorbid conditions or not? That's point one. And then when do you suspect? Suspicion could be, as, as I suggested, that it could be possibly because of just an increased frequency. It can happen in many elderly females where you may not even have the basic symptoms. The only thing it could be, you know, it could be just that the patient even has an electrolyte imbalance of hyponatremia, which could be because of actually an UTI. Similarly, increased vaulting, uh, burning micturations that has to be kept in mind. So, when you once you have the symptoms, by and large, what you do is simple thing that you send a urinary sample. A sample for the routine microscopic examination and for culture sensitivity. What you find usually is you do is you find cells, the normal cells, increased microscopic cells, and then you will also try to identify the organism. One thing you should always try to see in the urine is leukocyte esterase activity. I don't know whether I think now you get that in your SGPL code that you should ask for a leukocyte esterase activity. Many times you might actually send, you might even see specifically in ICU settings, you will see that there will be four or five cells and you might even see a clemcilla which is still growing there. Now, more and more what is happening that you see is if your leukocyte estrase activity is not there, that means the WBCs which are sitting there, they're not actually actively fighting that organism. It is as simple as that. It is just a bystander which is sitting there. If you go on trying to clear it, what will happen is more and more colonization and following which more and more resistance. And that is what is the basic cause of most of these ICU infections to become resistant. So you always try to see if you have cells, cells, if the cells are very high, that fair enough that you want to diagnose it. Otherwise, you have a borderline cell and you have growing, you are growing some organism, look for leukocyte esterase activity, and that will determine whether it is actually a bystander or it is causing a pathogenic pathological infection there. So Choosing an antibiotic is something that we really wanted to discuss here. That is, what is the class of patient? What is the culprit? What is the bacteria? And the patterns of an institute. So coming to this, 
the, when you talk about the class of patient, the first thing that is as simple as what as ma'am was also discussing, that is whether you want the patient is from hospital setup or the patient is from the community setup. And then you also want to hear about what is the antibiotic usage greater than 65 years of age, hospitalized in five last five years, uh, last five days, and whether the patient was catheterized or not. So just let me ask one simple question. How do you take out the sample in a catheterized patient? How do you send a urinary sample? You were suspecting infection. How do you send a urinary sample in a catheterized patient? I mean, that is something everybody is doing, that. Urologists, ICU guys, everybody, neurologists. Why you have to sample this? How do you send the sample? Oh, so every time you want to send you to be in this, right? No. So how do you send that? Is point. Break the police. Break the police, where? In between. Uh, not in between, means at the table. Somewhat correct. Some correct. Actually, you don't wait for two, three minutes. Two, three minutes is suppose somebody has pretty good amount. Suppose normally a person will have about 0.5 to 1 ml per, per, per kg per hour output. That is the usual expense, right? In two, three ml per minute, you're not going to get that much. You want, first, you actually <coughs> ensure that you just milk it a bit, whatever is stagnant, you drain it out. Then you clamp it. Then actually after clamping, you leave it for at least half an hour. You expect some bit of urine to collect, fresh urine, and then you clean the hub. Hub of the poly, and then you take a 5 ml syringe, insert, and then suck it out from there. Usually, what people do is they open the poly and then they start collecting. So, then you will always get something or the other. The second question is how many people are sending tip cultures, poly tip cultures? Poly tip cultures, uh, yeah, it's got tip culture. We say, na? How, how effective is it? And that's what you're doing in the board. Uh, but there are there is a thing we are doing it. Him and for TV the center line. Yeah. So by and large and international guidelines is you say no tip culture. Not even center line. The only place center line tip culture is actually allowed is one if you affect all the people to not take it, or the patient is a febrile uterine. That is the only place where actually febrile uterine pain is patient where you are supposed to send one, where you can actually allow internationally to send for tip culture. Otherwise, no tip cultures actually are accepted anywhere. We are also providing don't send tip cultures at all. That is the second thing. Okay, so that is exactly what you want to know the where the patient is from, what type of thing, whether he's catheterized, whether he was catheterized, and and what type of things that work. How many, you know that you say that the patient is an HAI after 48 hours. That is the usual definition, right? And then how long? discharge, 90 days for most, most organisms, it is 90 days, but certain organisms, it can be even more also. But it, for most organisms, it is three months that you actually take into account. Okay. So the culprits that we know about are classically E. coli. E. coli constitutes nearly 70% of all UTIs. And then we have enterococcus group, which actually we know that that is another thing which is becoming more and more common and is a very resistant organism. Then, of course, you have proteus, Klebsiella, Pseudomonas, Staph, Epidermidis and all. Now, when you know this, the third thing that you want to know is that the third point which we discussed was this. The sensitivity pattern of your own institute. Do you have sensitivity pattern of your own institute? Because I'll tell you this very simple. What we have realized, but day by day is that suppose I we just think KGMC, right? It's an old institute with multiple buildings looking old, depleted, some new one. So I have I2 in one old building, one building. So when you take collect data, what you see is the organism which is resistant. Suppose my my Trauma center organism, they come resistant. I2, they, they show resistance to pan resistance for even Klebsiella. But same thing, if when I look into my uh, medicine department IQ, there the Klebsiella is actually actually still sensitive to MECAS. My IQ in Sasabdi, where we have the oncological centers, there we are seeing that Klebsiella is not the most common organism. Most common organism is Candida. So what does it show? It shows you cannot actually treat UTI by international guidelines sitting in India. Point one. You cannot treat UTI by guidelines which are being even brought out by ICMR or even by me because your institute will have specific as per your antibiotic usage. And why is this difference? I'll give you one case for example. In 2017, Department of Medicine, we have 14 bed ICU. 
out of which eight patients used to, at a time used to be on cholesterol. When we came up with this point, that we said we will count how many cholesterols we are using per month per patient. So we started doing that. And, it, and we said we wanted to see how many cultures actually are being reported, how many cultures, how frequent. Slowly it came down. Now the cholesterol in 2019, just before the COVID pandemic, the total use of cholesterol in the whole year was seven. And I'm telling you the patient's profile is the same. It's not changing. Everyone says, I'm coming from there. Oh, I'm coming from there. 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 So it doesn't change. It is how you actually create your own mind. Now, that determines. For example, if, if you are using more of minocycline, then your tetracycline group will be less. Used. So, second question. Microbiologists must be there. There must be some urologists and all. Aapke aapke UTI mein, as of now, which is the best drug that you see? They are not seeing their cultures as activities. Or they are not doing one of those things. So right now, though most of the guidelines suggest, international guidelines suggest this. If I was the first, first person, if my hospital patient as ma'am said, I would go, I would go with nitroprilutine because as of now, this is not international. Well, nitroprilutine is more sensitive, even better, phosphomycin. You know how good phosphomycin is? It's not that. Anybody use phosphomycin? You must be using phosphomycin. Sorry. Three gram sachet, one bar do, one sachet, pura kamal ho gaya, right? The phosphomycin is so good. Now it has been said that even in pan resistant antibiotic bacterial infections, you are getting IV phosphomycin because it has very good even visceral penetration. But that doesn't mean you start using left and right. But phosphomycin, as of now, its sensitivity is considerably better than most other antibiotics. Okay, so phosphomycin, nitroferentoin, and all are very good. Even port trim, well, that is your septron, has come back. It is showing pretty good sensitivity pan India. In many places, you are seeing very good sensitivity to cotrimazole, cotrimoxazole. Cotrimazole fungal. Okay. Now, question two. You have a gram negative bacteria. Tumko mil gaya. They say quinolone will not. Which quinolone will you use? Abhi baat ho. Which quinolone will you use? Quinolone sensitive hai. Aapka lab diya quinolone sensitive. Paan, paan, paan ko kamil mil gaya. Kya quinolone is that? Gram negative bacteria. Hai. Kwa, kya quinolone? Antibiotic. Which relation has to be? What quinolone? Moxie should be avoided. Cipro should be given. Anything ready else? What about Nicoflox? Why? So, five days ago, you asked me, how many days ago? Three days ago. So, point one, point two, point three. You are right in many ways. So, not block, to block. To block is the drug of choice for most drama. There is one thing. If you remember your pharma, clonal have two generations. First generation, second generation. As the generation goes ahead, the gram positivity action goes on increasing, and gram negative action decreases. The first generation has a stronger gram negative action. So your UTIs are basically gram negative, gram negative organisms mostly. So your first choice is always quinolone or specifically tryptophan. Specifically male. Why in male do you use quinolone? Right. It has very good penetration into the prostate. So like exactly like your septran also. They have very good penetration to the prostate. So that is why you select quinolone. And quinolone usually is tryptophan is a drug of choice. If you look at all international guidelines, wherever they want to hit pseudomonas, it is always tryptophan. When they use quinolone. The more you go further down, moxie is actually more of a gram positive as compared to a gram negative bacteria, uh, antibiotic. Okay. Suppose if you are using, if you have an enterococcus, then what do you use? But UTI is not E. coli, enterococcus, leptella, you are done and then you are So what do you use for enterococcus? I think that is what ancestrally cell bacteria. Yeah, you get it infrequently here. Anything else? 0. 0.1234. Trancomycin, cytochrome, linozolate, aptomycin should be used only if you are called. If you look at the CLSI, if there is any microbiologist resident here, she will say, he or she will say. Then, as for the guidance, you won't put linozolate if you are anything before that is sensitive. That is point 0.1. Dapto is not a great drug for actually using it for, for urinary tract and all those things. It's not a very good drug as such. But you have to remember another thing. Your labs will give you something like a meropenem sensitivity and all. So, but you have to remember that enterococcus activity, in vivo action of meropenem against enterococcus is very poor. 
So the drug of choice goes like this. The first generation penicillin, the third generation penicillin, and if you're not, if the third generation penicillins are not acting, then you go for Vanco or Tico or Elimate. Or now if you're using, sometimes they give you aminoglycoside. If you're using aminoglycoside, it has to be high, high dose aminoglycoside along with secondary, another drug if it is sensitive. You might use another twin node. That is what you have to remember. So, agar aapke lab mein meropenem likhi aaye, don't start using meropenem for an enterococcus. It doesn't actually make much difference. It doesn't work very well there. So, your antibiotic profile, which you are selecting, has to be seen in in toto. Its penetration into the organ. Its actual final thing is how does it act in vivo. So, so finally, how long do you give? What is the final dose? And how long do you give? Duration kitna dete ho? So what we have written is five to seven days, right? So, you, so, so now in, in here you are you actually have to identify the site of it. bladder ka hai, urethral bladder ka hai, It is actually only three to five days. It is only in severe sepsis or nephritis uh, that you have to use for two weeks, maybe even sometimes for three weeks. But before for all other infections of UTI, five to seven days for most purposes is good enough. If the patient is critical, then you can use for 10 days. And then after stopping it, after stopping your antibiotics, give a five days clearance period and repeat your urinary sample. And then you might, if the patient has got complete clearance, that means you have completely cleared the infection. Otherwise, if there's incomplete clearance, then you will see again start a rise in your cells. That is how you try to actually treat specifically if the patient had fever episodes before you started antibiotics. So this is something basic that we all know about. For short course, lower, you need three days treatment, a ciplox or a, you know, nitrofentan good enough. And for reinfection, for what you want to prevent, reinfection is basically, you say when, ye aapne kiya, aapne stop kiya, uske paanj din baad aapne kiya, clear ho gaya. Uske baad phir hua. And ek saal mein more than three times ho raha, that means the patient is having recurrent complicated infection. In such patients, you need to put them on prophylaxis, and the prophylaxis is usually nitroferentoin. Candida, of course, you all know about it. Best thing is you remove the catheters and all, and you need at least two samples before you say that it is candiduria. And of course, and you can use fluconazole, but if you have very severe sepsis, then you can use echinokindans. So that's a little bit about all this. Thank you.